So uh, I will talk about Russian economy, uh, but uh, as I will argue, I will have to talk about Russian politics a lot as well, because both economy uh, has an impact on politics in Russia and uh, vice versa politics impacts heavily what's happening with the economy. Uh, and uh, I will talk about the trends, uh, the current trends and long-term trends in the Russian economy. I will also try to explain what's happening in uh, Russian economy. And there I would have to refer to political events as well. And then uh, I will talk about what could or should be done by Russian government and also we'll talk about what will actually be done, which uh, unfortunately is not the same thing. Uh, so Russian economic history in the last uh, 15 years has been a dramatic one. I should say that um, uh, the first uh, uh, several years of uh, this century has been a, 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 a epoch of uh, uh, spectacular growth never seen in Russian economic history before. Russian economy was growing at about 7% per year. Uh, then in 2009, it declined more than any other G20 economy by eight percentage points. Again, in the context of Ukraine, it's not as uh, big, but, but for Russia and for G20 countries, it was, it was uh, quite a shock. Then it was a recovery for two and a half years. And then uh, uh, from the second half of 2012, it was a slowdown. And uh, I I'm talking about this because in order to understand what's happened in 2014 and 15, it is important to understand this slowdown. And in order to understand the slowdown, it is important to understand what happened before the crisis. And so uh, this is the graph which shows you these dramatic uh, events in uh, quarterly data. Uh, you see that uh, when Mr. Putin came to power, he was still a prime, a prime minister at this point. He was a very lucky person to come at the very low point. And then he presided over a decade of uh, uh, economic growth. On average, it was 7% growth. So Russian economy pretty much doubled in terms of GDP per capita, which never happened. Even 1930s, uh, decade of Stalin's industrialization did not achieve growth rates like this. Then it was a collapse. Uh, in annual terms, minus 8%. In quarterly terms, some terms showed uh, more than 10% of decline. Then recovery was happening at four percentage points. And then after Russian economy reached uh, the level of GDP uh, of uh, pre-crisis peak, it started to decline. And you see the growth rate started to decline quite quickly. And again, uh, as I will argue, uh, it is not a coincidence that the, de the decline in growth rate started exactly after Mr. Putin came back, whatever you say, third time or fourth time in 2012, uh, investors um, had to adjust their expectations and uh, slow down started. Now, why economics and politics are important? Because um, uh, uh, first, slowdown actually contributed to foreign policy decisions that were made in 2014. And second, uh, economic uh, costs of foreign policy uh, will eventually uh, contribute to political events in Russia as well. So uh, this interaction is, is very important. Now, some people would say that uh, uh, economic growth in Russia was driven by commodity growth and benefits of this economic growth attributed only to the oligarchs. I should say that the data are not consistent with this um, theory. In terms of uh, uh, statistics, you see that, yes, oligarchs have benefited a lot. And inequality is actually very high. And if you look at pre-Crimean era, you would see that Russia is a home to uh, many oligarchs and many billionaires. In terms of number of people having a billion dollars or more, uh, Moscow is the capital of billionaires. Uh, and if you look at the wealth as a share of annual GDP, Russia beats uh, both uh, US and China by far. Uh, the level of inequality is very high. So Russia, according to a uh, uh, global wealth report by Credit Suisse, uh, Russia is the most unequal country in the world in terms of wealth distribution. Uh, however, if you actually try to track the level of inequality over time, you see that even though inequality is high, it has not gone up. It, can, it continued to be high at the same quantitative levels, and uh, everybody benefited from this growth, which is, again, going to be important for um, uh, the discussion about political 
components and political foundations of the regime. So if you look at uh, unemployment, poverty, real wages, uh, middle class, uh, then you see huge, huge uh, changes. So unemployment uh, went down from 14% when Mr. Putin came to power to something like 5%. Uh, poverty rate went down from something like 28% uh, to something like 10%. Uh, if you look at the poverty gap, which measures not just the number of people under poverty line, but the intensity of poverty, so the share of total income that you need to bring the poor towards the poverty line, this number collapsed from 6% to just 1%. And uh, in that sense, uh, Russia has pretty much eradicated poverty just in 10 years uh, under Mr. Putin's watch. Uh, which, of course, contributed to huge popularity among, uh, among the poor. Uh, now, that uh, explains why and how uh, uh, the regime remained popular in uh, 2000s. That was a kind of social contract where uh, the government did not even pretend to be moving into the direction of democracy. Uh, the freedoms were taken away. Um, government became more centralized, more bureaucratic, less accountable, and yet public was very happy. And um, uh, if you look at uh, income growth, you see that there is a reason for public's happiness. If you look at the correlation between economic performance and uh, Putin's approval ratings, uh, uh, Daniel Trisman, a professor uh, from University of California in Los Angeles, actually did a quantitative exercise and showed that there is a very strong correlation. And moreover, if you look at subjective life satisfaction, this is what we did with Ekaterina Zhuravska, you see that in Russia, in all transition countries, but in Russia in particular, uh, not surprisingly, when incomes go up, uh, uh, life satisfaction also goes up. Let me skip that. I, I can talk about uh, these issues uh, for a while, but uh, the uh, Takeaway is that's been a real growth. This growth benefited everybody and created a foundation for popularity of the regime. Now then what happened was very different. After the crisis, economy recovered reasonably quickly, uh, but uh, then it started to slow down. Why did it slow down? I participated in this debate and for me this is a very almost like a personal debate when uh, um, uh, policymakers, scholars, journalists were given all kinds of explanations to the slowdown. Uh, but if you actually look at the data, you can uh, quite quickly cross out most of these explanations. So essentially, uh, the quick answer is stories about global conspiracy or uh, uh, macroeconomic problems or external problems or uh, cyclical problems, all of that is not consistent with the data. The quick explanation is uh, Russian government is corrupt. Russian government doesn't want to fight corruption. Russian go government doesn't want re reforms. Investors finally understood that and started to take their money out. And uh, uh, other emerging markets at that particular time, some of them also slowed down, some didn't, but Russia underperformed its peers uh, by far except for, you would say, Brazil. And uh, today it's very hard to be very positive on Brazil, but uh, let, me, let me skip that for the moment. Anyway, so that, uh, that uh, source of problems was, uh, was uh, not clearly seen in 2011 and 2012 for yet another reason. Because Russia continued a credit boom in retail lending. Consumption was still growing uh, due to expanding credit, and it looked like growth continued. But that actually went out of uh, steam also around 2012, 2013. Even though expansion in credit was fast, it couldn't expand anymore. Now, a lot of people would say, how can you say that Russian credit to GDP cannot grow? It's too small. This is correct. If you compare Russian credit to GDP ratio to those numbers in uh, East European countries or West European countries, Russia would be uh, much behind. But this is a misleading comparison. You need to compare uh, non-mortgage loans because mortgage market is still very small in Russia and there are many reasons, including 
uh, political reasons why banks are not so happy to lend uh, long term. But if you look at the non-mortgage lending, then actually Russian consumer now owes something like 15% of GDP, 14, 15% of GDP, depending on the day and exchange rate, uh, to the banks. And this number is actually comparable to what uh, East European and West European com uh, consumers owe to the banks once you uh, take out mortgages. And in that sense, this growth can no longer continue. Banks are worried about huge debt overhang, and the central bank is actually worried even more. So, uh, but uh, most uh, strikingly was the dynamics of investment. So while uh, if you look at um, consumption, consumption uh, recovered quite quickly and continued to grow, as I said, but investment has actually never recovered to the pre-crisis peak. So, and uh, right now it's actually lower in real terms, in constant prices, than uh, it used to be in 2008. Uh, and uh, some people worry about stock prices in today's Russia. They, they're right. But the truth is stock prices underperformed even before Crimea. And uh, uh, even before Crimea, Russian stock prices were at about half of 2008 level. Now, if you think about European stocks, American stocks, these graphs uh, would be at a different, uh, different, different dimension. But the Russian stock market never returned to 2008 levels. And even before Crimea was trading at about half of what it should be trading. Uh, if you look at price earnings ratio, even before Crimea, Russian markets were uh, trading at 50% discount to comparable markets, comparable countries, uh, co co uh, comparable companies and comparable countries. And uh, some Russian companies und underperformed even more. So if you look at Gazprom, even before Crimea, Gazprom was only worth two annual profits, uh, which, of course, is not a surprise for anybody who knows how Gazprom uh, functions. Uh, so investors were indeed voting with their feet. Uh, if you look at uh, capital flows, you see that um, uh, after the crisis, capital returned and then started to come out again. Uh, in uh, September 2008, this is when the first net capital outflow was registered after the crisis. The debate was maybe it's not because of macroeconomic issues, maybe that's because the family of recently fired a mayor of Moscow, Mr. Lushkov, is taking their money out. And then uh, September passed, uh, October, so the stock of uh, capital taken out exceeded whatever, $20 billion, and so people said maybe even he didn't have that much money. Uh, and uh, then in 2011, people would say, well, capital outflow is probably explained by the fear of political instability, elections in 2011, elections in 2012. So let's wait for uh, elections to pass, and then Mr. Putin will come back, will get reinstalled, investors will be happy to see political order. And um, this is not what happened. Apparently, investors uh, were as unhappy about political stability as they were allegedly unhappy about political instability. And the reason, of course, is very simple. Russia remains a very corrupt country, unfriendly to the private sector. If you look at this uh, chart, which shows you the control of corruption, so least co corrupt countries are here, and this is the level of GDP, you see that, that Russia is not just more corrupt than Norway and Denmark. Uh, Russia is more corrupt than, uh, than countries with a similar income level, and Russia is as corrupt as the poorest, least developed countries in the world, uh, in uh, sub-Saharan Africa. So, uh, in that sense, uh, uh, government has been asked to fight corruption many times. Government promised to fight corruption many times. And uh, Mr. Putin, when he came back as president again, uh, actually put it in writing said, I will fight corruption, I will privatize, I will deregulate, economic growth will be so much, Russia will rise in uh, uh, international rankings of corruption and doing business uh, indicators by so much. And then uh, investors were extremely excited about this, but then somehow they didn't see that happening and, and were disillusioned. Now why? Uh, if you ignore politics, you would say any regime needs economic growth. Uh, even if you're non-democratic, you would think that, okay, the bigger the GDP, the more I can grab from that GDP. Uh, that logic is superficial. Why? Because uh, 
uh, if you need, in order to grow GDP, if you need the reforms that create internal competition and external competition, if they create uh, uh, independent political uh, power from the middle class, if it constrains your ability to um, expropriate private, uh, uh, private owners, then actually these reforms may undermine your chances to stay in power and get your piece of this cake. And so the choice is not uh, a piece in a big cake and a piece in a small cake. The choice is a big piece in a small cake or no piece in a big cake. And then you, your choice becomes very easy and then you s stick to the policies which result in stagnation, but you remain in power and continue to run the country. And so that uh, brought us to the situation where you have slowdown and the need to come up with a new social contract. The old social contract where growth was out there and you could say, yes, we are corrupt, but your incomes are growing. This social contract disappeared. And after uh, Sochi Olympics were over, the government needed to think about new social contract and uh, uh, they saw a great opportunity to create a new um, approach to talking to the public based on imperial expansion and nationalistic uh, rhetoric. And this is, this is the uh, new reality. And unfortunately, of course, this reality is very painful for Russian economic perspectives because the Russian economy, as of now, is facing a perfect storm. It has three headwinds. One, which I described before, lack of reform, corrupt government, over-regulation, uh, absence of the modern, effective, and independent judiciary system. Second issue is lower oil prices, and third issue is uh, the sanctions. And these uh, headwinds actually reinforce each other. If oil price goes down, but you still have access to capital markets, you can borrow and wait until the oil price goes up. But with sanctions, you cannot borrow anymore. And uh, in that sense, sanctions are especially painful during uh, the oil uh, uh, price uh, uh, de decrease uh, phase. And uh, that, uh, that actually hits the economy pretty hard. And so the consensus in the market is that GDP growth in 2015 will be minus 4 or minus 5%, unless oil prices go up uh, substantially. And uh, unlike 2009, uh, that will also be accompanied by the fall in real incomes. In 2008, 2009, government used reserves, which were bigger at that time, and spent a lot to maintain incomes of the public. It's not going to happen this time. Now, some people would say that Russian ruble uh, depreciated, but so did uh, other oil cur cur currencies. This is not the case. So Russian, if you actually look at the numbers, Russian ruble lost about 40% of its value while other oil uh, currencies lost about 20%. Uh, so let me, let me skip inflation for the moment. Uh, let me talk a little bit about capital flight. So I talked about how capital flight has been large and painful in 2011 and 2012, uh, but at that point it was 3 or 4% of GDP. In 2014, capital flight was about 12% of GDP. Uh, in 2015, official forecast, which usually airs on a lower side, is 10% of GDP. So we are talking about major, major uh, impact of sanctions, external debt, and lower oil price. And then we come to the very important issue, which is what's going to happen with the government budget. Now, today, Russia lives with a budget, which was prepared in July 2014 based on $100 per barrel and 2% growth. So, of course, with that budget, you have a substantial deficit, uh, which accounts for about uh, 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 6%. Uh, and uh, if we don't make any changes in this budget, in 2015, Russia will out run out of reserve fund, because the reserve fund is also 6% of GDP. So government, of course, understands that. And government is cutting expenses and preparing a budget, which is already now actually in the parliament. And that budget says, let's do something and run out of the money, not by the end of this year, but by the end of the next year. 
And so the current budget proposal is, let's assume minus 3% change in GDP. As I said, markets are more pessimistic than minus three. And then let's cut, uh, let's almost not cut in nominal terms. Let's cut by two percentage points. Now, that is actually uh, uh, an attempt to use no nominal illusion, in a sense saying we are almost not cutting anything. But since inflation is much higher than projected last year, when the projection was 5%, now inflation is at best 11%, and some people would say would be 15%. We are talking about really major falls in real incomes of people depending on the state. And in that sense, 2015 will be politically difficult, uh, but uh, not catastrophic, of course, but uh, still it will be already politically difficult. Now, if oil price stays low, by the end of the 2016, Russia will run out of uh, reserves, reserve fund, let's put it this way. Uh, and uh, in that, at that point, the Russian government will have to cut more aggressively military expenses or pensions or teacher salaries or doctor salaries or, God forbid, uh, incomes of uh, people close to the regime. So uh, a lot of people talk about the problem of external debt. This is a huge problem, but I should say that this problem is uh, often overestimated. So uh, Russian sovereign debt is very low, and it's not a problem, and it's not going to be a problem. But then there is also bank debt and corporate debt, of state banks, state companies, and private banks and private companies, which used to be a quarter of annual GDP. Now it's more like 50% of annual GDP. And uh, some of that is actually denominated in rubles. So that is not a big problem. But a lot, of course, is denominated in foreign currency. And uh, uh, about 120 billion of that matures this year. So somebody will have to pay it. The current solution is that the central bank will take its reserves lend it to Russian banks. Russian banks will lend, it to, lend them to Russian companies, and Russian companies will repay foreign creditors. This scheme is completely viable, and it is viable at least for two years, and maybe actually more, uh, more, more like for three years. So when people say that Russian companies will default this year, maybe some defaults will happen, but if Russian government doesn't want say Gazprom or Rosneft or Sberbank or BTB to default, they don't need to. Russia does have enough foreign currency to make sure that at least for a couple of years uh, things, uh, things will work uh, reasonably well. And now let me talk very briefly about the new, uh, uh, the new structure of the regime. A lot of people would say, how come with those uh, uh, potentially problematic and uh, maybe even catastrophic economic perspectives regime functions, and, re and Mr. Putin remains popular with whatever 88% approval rank. This regime has no ideology. This regime has no mass repression. How come uh, it's uh, functioning so well? And uh, the answer to that is information. This regime is very modern in, in using informational tools, which are propaganda, censorship, and also some material tools like cooptation. And together with uh, Daniel Triesman, whom I already mentioned, we have a theory of new authoritarianism, which is not uniquely applicable to Russia. It also uh, de describes well countries like modern Turkey or Hungary or Venezuela. And actually, our paper generates a lot of debate in Hungary, which we unfortunately cannot follow. Uh, but basically, the story is um, that uh, this is a dictatorship which doesn't use repression but uses propaganda for the general public and censorship and co-optation for the elite. And basically the deal the dictator offers to the elite is, yes, you understand that I'm not competent and I'm not running the economy well, but here is a deal for you. You can try to tell it to the public, in which case I will censor uh, your information, or you can uh, actually join me and I will share material benefits with you. And of course, as you have a shrinking pie, of course, as GDP is falling and oil prices has fallen, it's harder to co-opt because you run out of cash. And this regime cannot last forever. But we show that these regimes can be actually quite stable, quite sustainable, and actually do reasonably well for a long period of time. 
And uh, as I said, it's not a unique uh, story. Actually, most dictatorships today around the world, unlike what happened 40 years ago, do not rely on uh, mass killings. They rely on uh, parliaments. They rely on elections. Um, and of course, uh, the key to that is uh, information. So let me, let me skip the multiple equilibria story. I will just say that Russia today, in terms of this model, is very different from Russia two years ago. Russia two years ago was relying much more on cooptation, and now it relies much more on censorship. And uh, in this model, we do have, we do have multiple equilibria, uh, which behave very, very differently uh, in that sense. And so uh, the question is, what does what I was talking about imply for the future? So uh, I think uh, we should um, assume the mainstream scenario, baseline scenario in which oil prices don't go up or down, in which Russian government doesn't make grave economic policy mistakes, which may happen, and in which Russian uh, government doesn't undertake further foreign policy adventures, which also may happen. So in this baseline scenario, uh, Russian economy will be in recession this year for sure, and most likely next year as well. But uh, it will not run out of cash before second half of 2016. Uh, it will not be able to return uh, territory back to um, Ukraine because Mr. Putin cannot come back and say to the Russian public, sorry, I was incompetent. Uh, sorry, it won't, it won't be the discussion I was r bad or immoral. It would be the discussion like, uh, why didn't you calculate the implications of your actions? Are you not rational enough? Are you not prepared enough to lead the whole country? Uh, maybe you're incompetent to stay at the helm. So this is the debate Mr. Putin doesn't like. And I think he will continue to destabilize uh, Ukraine in the next couple of years. But he will also pretend that these are not Russian soldiers who are in, in Ukraine. Uh, and uh, in that scenario, the crucial point will come sometime in 2016, where Mr. Putin will uh, decide uh, which budget items will be cut, who is going to pay for all of this. And then this will create a lot of unhappy people. And as I said, some cuts will happen in real terms in 2015, but also uh, propaganda is effective, and so I don't expect big changes in 2015. In the second half of 2016, given the uh, parliamentary elections in the end of 2016, we may actually see uh, some uh, turbulence. And then, uh, of course, uh, a lot of people would uh, ask a question, how, if, the regime change, hap uh, regime change happens, how will it happen? And I don't have an answer to that. The only, uh, the only certainty we have about regime changes like this is that it's highly uncertain. I think uh, in uh, democratic countries we can say for sure that uh, leaders change through elections. In countries like this, regime changes may be happening in a variety of scenarios. One thing I would just add is we don't even have a precedent in human history when a country as developed as Russia today moves from dictatorship to democracy. Does that mean that this move will not happen? Of course, Russia will become a democratic and prosperous country at some point. But in what way this transition will happen, we don't know. Will it be violent? Will it be uh, velvet? Will it be soft or, or uh, painful? That we don't know. But uh, let me end on this uh, optimistic note. I should say that in the long run, of course, Russia will become a, a democratic and peaceful country and a prosperous as well. Thank you. It is, uh, of course, uh, difficult to add something new uh, to Sergei's impressive analysis. But I would like just to add a few uh, additional comments. And uh, I will try to uh, focus on issues which Sergei didn't address. I agree with him in most uh, arguments, so I will not uh, uh, add to this. Uh, well, uh, basically, uh, it was shown that uh, 
Uh, there are many challenges which Russia is facing. Uh, these challenges are both old and new. Uh, about the role of energy, uh, we know quite well. Uh, well, maybe uh, perhaps to add that uh, apart from the obvious negative effects on Russian economy, uh, there may be also some positive effects like uh, increased pressures on energy supply and export diversification, both in the European Union and in Russia. These uh, sectoral sanctions uh, are, of course, uh, already painful. They are no uh, longer symbolic. And the most important effect of these sanctions is, from my point of view, uh, the additional deterioration of the investment climate. But uh, this is what I didn't want to say. Uh, perhaps more important issue is that the current political and economic environment in Russia is threatening this effort on diversification and modernization of the economy. So again, these efforts have been attempted for many years, uh, already before uh, let's say, the second term of uh, uh, Mr. Putin. In fact, uh, it has started uh, under the uh, former president Medvedev. Uh, now, the question is, uh, uh, what about the effect of these sanctions? Is it possible that uh, perhaps uh, these uh, sanctions may somehow increase reform pressures? Uh, well, many people said uh, before uh, the sanction situation that uh, uh, Russia suffers from a kind of Dutch disease, which means that uh, as long as oil price is $100 per barrel, uh, in fact, Russia didn't have sufficient incentive to modernize and diversify. Now, with oil prices uh, in the range of 50, and with prospect that uh, this situation will last for a longer time, there may be perhaps uh, more pressures for modernization, also using industrial policies. We have uh, learned uh, today morning that uh, these industrial policies are again, so to say, resurrected even in uh, developed economies of the European Union. Uh, so uh, this uh, perhaps could be instrumental uh, to uh, modernization. However, at the same time, modernization will be definitely more difficult without foreign direct investments, without technology imports, and in a climate of isolation, isolation and hostility. Uh, I don't think that uh, the uh, Russian orientation towards Eastern Asia, China, and so on could compensate deteriorating relations with the European Union. Uh, Sergei spoke a lot about political impacts of uh, uh, the conflict and of the current uh, situation in Russia. Uh, we have uh, very uh, serious questions uh, regarding the stability of the ruling elite. Uh, we have this paradox situation that Putin ratings are growing. Russia's uh, credit ratings are falling. Uh, ruble and uh, uh, Moscow exchange rates are fluctuating. Uh, so far, uh, Putin enjoys uh, very <laughs> uh, huge uh, support and popularity in the Russian population. But this may change uh, with uh, more hardship. However, uh, this is an open question because uh, there are many speculations regarding the Russian soul and Russian uh, behavior and so on. Uh, last uh, thing which I wanted to say and uh, which I think is important uh, from the more global point of view, the impact of the sanctions and Russian crisis is that uh, this Putin's pet project about the integration on the post-Soviet space is definitely derailed. Uh, even such uh, uh, political leaders like 
Belarusian uh, President Lukashenko or Kazakhstan President Nazarbayev are not very amused about uh, Russian behavior uh, in the post-Soviet space. And uh, definitely uh, the annexation of Crimea was not helpful for this uh, Putin's Euro-Asian integration project. And uh, last but not least, this is my last comment to uh, this uh, Russian uh, case, so to say, is that uh, all these developments in Russia on the post-Soviet space in the European Union will definitely require a new design of uh, European policies, European neighborhood policies. This Eastern Partnership uh, reform or relaunch is now work in progress. Uh, it has been admitted that uh, also European Union made a lot of mistakes in this uh, Eastern Partnership and European neighborhood policies. And as I have said, uh, this uh, whole partnership project is currently under review and the new commissioner, Johannes Hahn, is very much in charge of this. So this is uh, uh, very briefly my comment to the Russian and global case. Then I will have also a few remarks to the uh, Ukrainian presentation after I hear what uh, Vlad is going to say because I didn't know. <laughs> Thank you.